Welcome to Here Be Dragons, a practical guide to wonder and meaning in life. Um, the earlier time that I did this class last summer, I had, uh, on the first day, we had this packet of poems that I'd given everyone to read, and I had an opening lecture that talked about those poems. This time around, I've restructured the reading a little bit in order to make room for some things, specifically the never ending story. And so, um, as the syllabus shook out, that opening lecture slot was no longer available. But I was really looking at that material and trying to figure out how I could work it into what we, what discussions we did have ahead of us, and I couldn't find a really good way to do so. So what I've decided to do is record this first lecture for you, so you sort of get a bonus lecture for the class, so that we can have some of that material in our background as we go through this together. So, um, and what follows, this is the lecture, A Symbol of the Power of Heaven, the Nature and Meaning of Dragons. How should we be able to forget those ancient myths that are at the beginning of all peoples? The myths about dragons that are at the last moment turn into princesses. Perhaps all of the dragons of our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us once beautiful and brave. Perhaps everything terrible is in its deepest being something helpless that wants help from us. So you must not be frightened if a sadness rises up before you larger than any you have ever seen. If a restiveness like light and cloud shadows passes over your hands and over all you do, you must think that something is happening with you, that life has not forgotten you, that it holds you in its hand. It will not let you fall. Why do you want to shut out of your life any uneasiness, any miseries, or any depressions? For after all, you do not know what work these conditions are doing inside of you. That from Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet. Ursula Le Guin says, We men dream dreams. We work magic. We do good. We do evil. The dragons do not dream. They are dreams. They do not work magic. It is their substance, their being. They do not do. They are. Tolkien says, and on fairy stories, I desire dragons with a profound desire. Of course, I and my timid body did not wish to have them in the neighborhood, but the world that contained even the imagination of Fafnir was richer and more beautiful at whatever the cost of peril. And Ursula Le Guin again says, And though I came to forget or regret all I have ever done, yet would I remember that once I saw the dragons aloft on the wind at sunset above the Western Isles, and I would be content. I hope here at the beginning, when all things are new and everything is possible, that you will allow me a little patience and indulgence, for I must admit the embarrassing incongruity that lies at the heart of this class. I have not hidden it from you. Indeed, I have enshrined it right in the subtitle. This course is, I have claimed, quote, a practical field guide to wonder and meaning in life, end quote. Let me unpack this a little. A field guide is a book produced with the intention that the buyer would take it with him into the field, whatever the appropriate field is for the subject matter at hand. So you might have a field guide for geology, which you would take with you rock hunting, or ornithology, which you should take when going birding, or draconology, which you would take when going dragon hunting or dragon washing. A practical field guide is a subspecies of this literary genre that eschews theoretical and speculative concerns in order to focus attention on the subject matter as it will appear in the wild. Or rather, such theoretical concerns are not excluded, but they are only included to the extent that they directly bear upon the actual business of hunting rocks, birds, or dragons, to continue the examples from above. So you see, a field guide, and above all, a practical field guide, belongs to that realm of things that one would expect to be least concerned with transcendence. There is about it all the air of the scientific, in the most popular sense of that word, the pragmatic, the mundane. It is written not for the specialist, but for the tourist. And it is not hard to envision its users missing out on the things they came to see because their heads are buried in the field guide. This field guide is meant to tell them how to think about what they're seeing. Indeed, I believe many such a guide was read more as a proxy by those who didn't even bother with going to the field but wanted only to be able to pretend that they had done so by assimilating the facts contained therein. Well, that's all fairly uninspiring. 
Why have I chosen such a banal idea for the subtitle of a course that promises the heights of fancy? Because, you know, dragons. Well, let's consider what it is a field guide to. Not to dragons. No, this is not a field guide to draconology. Rather, it is a field guide to wonder and meaning. Let's dwell on the first of those for a second. What could be further from the clinical, pragmatic, touristy image of the field guide than the notion of wonder? The field guide tends rather to have the effect of squashing wonder, reducing it to a set of facts and figures. But wonder is that which arises in the face of something that exceeds our expectations. I've written this about it elsewhere. Wonder is the response we have in the moment of the recognition of great disparity. Thus, we wonder when we learn something new, which is really a recognition either of the prior depths of our ignorance or the newly revealed depths of the world. We wonder before that which is unexpected, because of the disparity between our expectations and what has happened. Before that which is a breakthrough, because of how unimaginable it seemed such a short while ago before that which required great strength or intellect or industry in order to exist, and at unhoped for joys and sorrows. Wonder is then the experience of being confronted with the conviction that the world is greater than our regular experience of it. It accuses us of having a diminished view of the world and convicts us for making our experience of diminishment normative. What would a practical field guide to such a thing look like? The field guide helps you to spot and identify what you're looking for, and the practical field guide is focused on tips that will prepare you for what you will encounter in the field. So a practical field guide to wonder would have to equip you with those things that are conducive to encountering wonder while you're out in the field, which in this case is life itself. And what is conducive to wonder is a certain openness of mind and soul, an attitude that resists being accused by wonder of having too small a world by always holding itself open to invasion by the world. In this way does wonder convert perhaps the driest of literary genres into magnificence. And here I want to think about this first poem, The Dragon and the Undying by Siegfried Sassoon. All night the flares go up, the dragon sings, and beats upon the dark with furious wings, and, stung to rage by his own darting fires, reaches with grappling coils from town to town. He lusts to break the loveliness of spires, and hurls their martyred music toppling down. Yet, though the slain are homeless as the breeze, vocal are they, like storm-bewildered seas. Their faces are the fair, unshrouded night, and planets are their eyes, their ageless dreams. Tenderly stooping earthward from their height, they wander in the dusk with chanting streams, and they are dawnlit trees with arms upflung to hail the burning heavens they left unsung. This is a very good poem. At the beginning of it, we see this notion of the dragon's attack. The dragon is furious. Why? We don't know exactly, but one thing we know is that part of this rage is self-inflicted. Line 3 says the dragon is stung to rage by his own darting fires. Often in dragon stories, the dragon is immune to dragon fire, so there's no good having one dragon breathe on another. They don't have to worry about accidentally singeing themselves when they breathe. But in here, there's a sense in which the fires are harmful to the dragon. They may do no physical harm, but they serve to stoke it up emotionally. The dragon here represents a type of blind rage that is self-fueled and therefore will never, can never really be spent. He goes from town to town, right? What is his desire? He lusts to break the loveliness of spires and hurl their martyred music, the bells at the tops of the spires, hurl that music toppling down, martyred music, the sound the bells make as they fall to the ground, giving witness to the beauty of their sound, but also giving witness to their own destruction as it is their fall that is causing them to ring. But this is really interesting here. The poem takes a turn. The slain, the dead, the ones the dragon has just killed, they're homeless as the breeze, which wanders all over the earth and never finds a place to rest, but they're vocal. Their death is not silent. Um, they take on the 
visage of the starry night. The planets become their eyes and their dreams. And this last little bit, their dawn lit trees with arms up flung to hail the burning heavens are left unsung. There's a sense in which, yes, it's literal trees that represent everything in nature represents the dead as their voice, the voice of their beauty, the voice of their song remains despite what the dragon can do. But they also are the sense of lit torches as you see figures on fire with dragon fire throwing their arms up in despair. Um, this is... This is not the type of world you really want to live in. A world where this type of thing is a possibility. Where you wonder as you go to sleep at night if the very joy that you feel in community, in the presence of family and loved ones and work well done, meaningful work well done, is the very thing that's going to provoke the jealousy of a dragon to come and cast your town to the ground. Let's go back to those quotes that I read at the beginning of class. They all have in common the unwavering belief that in spite of the horror of dragons, one simply cannot stand not to have them. That to have seen a dragon, or perhaps just to have been in a world in which there are dragons, is the kind of thing that can give lasting meaning to life, that can make one feel that everything has somehow mattered. And so we come naturally to the second realm to which this course serves as a practical field guide, namely, meaning in life. Now, frankly, this second realm is not so much pedagogical as it is catechetical and personal. It is about learning how to be in the world. But the greatest obstacle to a meaningful life seems to be life itself, which assaults us with a mind-numbing succession of the same, with the tyranny of the annoying, with the inescapable necessity to do now what one would rather never do at all. Bills, chores, repairs, meaningless labor, dull people you can't avoid. At every turn, you find that when you would look up, you are required to look down. When you would break out, that you get drawn back in. When you would soar over fantastical landscapes, that you are instead obliged to crawl through the mud. Against such a tragedy, we have dragons. The very idea of them works to undermine this world and overturn it. And I think this is well shown in a poem by Joe Walton called Nidhogg. First of all, and last of all, and gnawing at the root, beside the wall, beneath the hall, in darkness absolute. Far below feasts and fighting, far from the folk of earth, relentless in her biting at courage, love, and mirth. The deepest dragon coils and curls, nose twitches, ears flick. Through all the noise of all the worlds, she hears the missile trick. Light and gods are far away. Bound fire will never bend. So broken promises today mean world and trees must end. She learned the lore so long ago, she silently keeps score. The dragon in the shadow, the worm at the world tree's core. For when the new world comes to be, she'll spread her wings and rise and fill the world with dragons free. It is her promised prize. Then dragon wings will crease the sky. Humans and gods will learn that dragons speak and dragons fly and dragon fire will burn. Deep down, impatient Nidhogg toils until the tree shall fall. Around the root she curls and coils, first of all, last of all. This poem is a reference to the dragon Nidhogg, which in Norse mythology is imprisoned beneath Yggdrasil, the world tree that connects all of the all of the nine realms. And um, she is gnawing at the roots of Yggdrasil, attempting to bring Yggdrasil crashing down. And the whole time she's down there, she's giving birth to more dragons that join her in this mission of trying to bring down the world tree and therefore bring down all of the nine realms. At Ragnarok, which is the um, Norse um, Armageddon, when the gods will face off against the great monsters and most of the gods, if not all of the gods, will be slain and killed. And the world will be overturned and a new world will come to be somehow on the basis of the work of Sigurd Dragonslayer. When Ragnarok begins, Nighog is to be released from her imprisonment beneath the tree. And that's what it references when it says, um, when the new world comes to be, she'll spread her wings and rise and fill the world with dragons free. Right, so there's this, there's this army of dragons at the root of reality, gnawing away at reality, at this established order, at the rules of Asgard, 
that will break free and sail through the skies at some point. But this new world can only begin in this mythology when the gods die. Ragnarok is in German called Goethe Damero, the twilight of the gods. Odin will be slain. Thor will be slain. Freya will be slain. On and on it goes as all the great gods of Asgard are defeated by these monsters. Children of Chaos. Children of Loki. So we can see that the dragons are at work undermining the drab world. So when you feel that you cannot go on, that you are at an impasse through which you cannot break, remember as my gift to you that you have seen dragons soaring across the skies of Narnia and raising Lake Town that you have heard the boast of Fafnir and seen the outworkings of the curse of the Rheingold, that you have seen the fabled hall of Hrothgar and trod the weary paths of exile with Turin son of Hurin. That is the stuff of heroes, and it will set you apart. You see, in a world without dragons, we are safe from dragon breath. But we are also safe from greatness. I would like to suggest that it is not at all clear that dragons are the greater horror. This is, to my mind, the question that everyone has for us, which is some variation of, but why do dragons matter? It comes down to two things. The first is that we need dragons. We need them because we are made for Eden, a world of wonders beyond imagining. Shrouded in the mystery of animal personal identity, that is to say, the knot of questions that considers whether particular animals will live forever after the resurrection and what the nature of the animal life cycle was when the world was deathless. Shrouded behind this mystery is the reality that we cannot wrap our minds around that the nature of the world we lost when we were barred by angel and sword from the paradise of God and man. We simply can't fathom it. Every day in which we do not encounter figural or literal dragons, we foster a forgetfulness of who we are and what we are made for. We progress the deeply seductive and greatly offensive lie that we are made for drudgery, that life is work and pain and then you die. And after that, well, after that comes the bliss of oblivion, the certainty that none of it mattered anyway, and that you will not even be a you to care about the rank profanity of that idea. This lie, born of the devil and propagated by all of us in our selfish moments when we vainly and stupidly imagine that we honor ourselves by trampling on our glory. This lie chokes wonder and joy out of our hearts, leaving in their place only ash, bitterness, depression, and impotent rage. But when we create dragons, wonder rises like a phoenix from the ashes, and we live again. And we remember who and what we are. And we remember the ground of praise. Now, secondly, and equally importantly, dragons are real because thoughts are real. Dragons are not a human idea, nor are they Satan's idea. He merely takes on the form of a serpent. It is God who created serpents. Everything that dragons represent, God built into the world as the ground of wonder. All of this we do through the power of books and stories. So consider the poem, I Met a Dragon Face to Face by Jack Prelitsky. I met a dragon face to face the year when I was ten. I took a trip to outer space. I braved a pirate's den. I wrestled with a wicked troll and fought a great white shark. I trailed a rabbit down a hole and hunted for a snark. I stowed a butter aboard a submarine. I opened magic doors. I traveled in a time machine and searched for dinosaurs. I climbed atop a giant's head. I found a pot of gold. I did all this in books I read when I was ten years old. Isn't that wonderful? Books, every book, they're a gateway to everything fantastical. All the magical, mystical, wondrous experiences that you want to have in the world, books are gateways to those things, but like every gateway, there's a price of admission. There's a cost for the ticket. And the price of admission is a childlike wonder. He did all these things when he was 10 years old. I wonder what he's done at 30. It's quite possible that 30 for this author is every bit as magical and wondrous as 10, but the truth is the odds are not in his favor. Because as we get older, we settle in. As we get older, we settle down. We become steady. We put away childish dreams, childish hopes, childish wonder. 
these books on dragons are so many training exercises that strengthen the parts of us that are really ma that really matter for the fight that's coming. This is our task and our common goal in this class. And so our work is deadly serious. It's as serious as sin. But don't forget to laugh. The Lord laughs the devil to scorn in Psalm 2. Not just because of the weakness of Satan's power compared to God's, but also because the Lord has built a world of delights, and he would not allow evil to crush the joy of it. So go forward with wariness and watchfulness, but also with joy and a happy heart, because the prophecy has been fulfilled and the serpent is overthrown, even though one act remains to be played in the great battle between the two. We are already past the tipping point, and while those not in the know look ahead anxiously to see who will win, we know that from the moment the God-man rose from the dead, the outcome was assured. Dragons are always less scary when a mighty hero is in our midst. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind as we think about this course and where we're going with this course, um, some of the things that I'd like to, just some ideas I'd like to play with here at the beginning, um, is first of all, just understanding what dragons are. And that question can be as simple as how do we classify them? Like what counts as a dragon versus not? We have we have dragons in our world, right? We have Komodo dragons and the bearded dragon, and and you go to the, you can go to the zoo and see them. And generally speaking, if you're going looking for something that goes by the name of a dragon, you're going to be somewhat disappointed because they look a lot more like a very big iguana than like a very small dragon. So, and I think this is important. Um, it's certainly important for how I think about dragons uh, and how we'll talk about them in this class. A dragon isn't just a big serpent. It's not just a big lizard. That's not enough for something that counts as a dragon. And indeed, here's a list of attributes which are common to many literary dragons, none of which I think is essential to what it is that makes something a dragon. So dragons may fly, they may have fire breath or any other form of devastating exhalation, ice breath, poison gas, acid. Uh, they can have magical powers. And in, in some worlds, they have been spellcasters, uh, wizards and sorcerers and the like. They can speak often, but not necessarily. Harry Potter dragons don't speak. And of course, it may be the case that they love gold. None of that, though, I think is essential to what a dragon is. For each of those attributes, I can find a literary dragon that doesn't have that attribute, but that still has that something that makes it a dragon. It still has draconitas, if you will. So what is essential? I think it's that they're mythological. So on the one hand, this means that they are the antagonist par excellence, right? Our blood feud with dragons goes back to the beginning of our race. Consider this portion of the Genesis story in, in <clears throat> Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Skipping ahead a little bit. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and, her, and yours. Sorry, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you have listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. 
Dragons, then, are the ancientest of foes. If Smaug is not the chiefest of calamities, it is not because dragons are not. It is because he is not. Now, the other side of the mythological coin is that what it means for them to be mythological is that dragons aren't garden variety. They are larger than life, and when they show up, it is always significant. It changes the course of history. Consider what Job 41 says about the Leviathan. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will, you speak, will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of it like a bird or put it on a leash for the young women in your house? Will traders barter for it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can bent penetrate its double coat of armor? Who dares to open the doors of its mouth, ringed about with fearsome teeth? Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between scales. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Its snorting throws out flashes of light, as if it's breathing fire. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth, sparks of fire shoot out, smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from its mouth. Strength resides in its neck, dismay goes before it. The folds of its flesh are tightly joined, they are firm and immovable. Its chest is hard as rock, hard as a lower millstone. When it rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before its thrashing. The sword that reaches it has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron it treats like straw, and bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make it flee. Slingstones are like chaff to it. A club seems to it but a piece of straw. It laughs at the rattling of the lance. Its undersides are jagged potsherds, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. Now, all of that, Job 41, is not dragony enough for you. Verse 21 in the Vulgate reads, The rays of the sun are under it, and it paves gold for itself like mud. Um, there is in theology a notion that gets applied to God. In Latin, we say, Deus semper maior. God is always more, or the ever greater God. It is not just that God is more, right? More than what? More than anything you can name and more than everything you can name. That, that, that's a common transcendence because it only means that he is the greatest thing compared to other things. But an ever greater God is a God whose greatness does not lie in comparison because it is dynamic and growing into more and more greatness whatever the circumstances. This is not just a transcending God, but a transcendent God. The same concept could be ascribed to dragons. And this is what I mean by this mythological sense. Mythological doesn't mean not real. Mythological has to do with the moreness, the greatness uh, that they bring with them. And I think the same concept could be ascribed to dragons in a, in a qualified sense. And a final knight to her love and foe makes this point well. Um, this is a poem that speaks of... Um, hang on, I need to pull this up. I don't have this one ready. Let's get this one pulled up. Pardon me. So, a, a final night, let's see, a final a final night to her love and foe by Amal el uh reads as follows. Do I love you more when you roar or speak? In flight, a shadow beneath me and the sky, or bending your strength to nuzzle my palm, my cheek? Do I love you more ridden or devouring? Unbidden or scouring a countryside, an enemy fleet? Do I love you more in triumph or defeat? Do I love you more by way of rivers, 
water-bearing, rain-making, heaven-born, and sinuous as thrill, or as fire-breathing, mountain-shaking, livestock-thieving, treasure-taking, boundless hunger, clap of thunder, hoarder of the world's delights. Do I love you when you fight or when you yield your scales to my flesh? This weak mesh of blood and bone to your fires and stone, your riddles, your greeting. Do I love you most in parting or in meeting, solid or fleeting? Do I love you by your head or by your tail, your wings or your teeth, your hard armor above or your softness beneath? Do I love you by your breath or by your depth, your vast size or perched upon my shoulder in surprise? Your eyes are everything, are all the world, tail and mouth meeting, unmaking, repeating, feeding and fed, mountain and bed. I love you as I love the vast, unnameable, untouchable, impossible star-strewn sky and the severed thread, or a poem in its stead. I love you living, and I love you dead. really like this this last stanza um i love you as i love the vast unnameable untouchable impossible star strewn sky on the one hand and as i love a severed thread or as i love a poem in its stead um this is the the greatness of the dragon is that whether they're a foe or a friend whether they're massive or tiny whether they are something that like a, a horse that you would ride into battle or ride off to rescue the princess or whether they're the great danger against which you ride however you place them however you use them whether they're fire dragons or the eastern water dragons they are to be loved they're loved by this poet because they represent everything right your eyes are everything are all the world there's a greatness to dragons that um, is the reason why I don't think they should be just a random creature in the world like cats and dogs and other things like that. That's what I don't really like about Harry Potter's dragons is that they're particularly exotic animals and that's about all there is to them. Um, dragons should bring with them all the things that go beyond the realm of what we normally know and experience. I love you living, I love you dead. Dragons are not always bad especially not in our more modern high fantasy versions of them. They come to represent not merely danger, but also magic and wonder. They are signs that the world is more marvelous and dangerous than we care to remember or dare to hope. They remind us that the world of our science is just the tip of the iceberg and that 90% of reality lies below the scientific surface. There, where all our maps fail, and our theories fall silent. Ancient leviathans of mighty power roam and act in ways that impact the rise and fall of many a human's, puny human soul. There in the margins, there in the boundaries, there beyond what we can sense, there be dragons. <laughs>